Welcome to the Fissionary Podcast, sponsored by Alchemy and hosted by me, Jim Maroos. This podcast shines a light on financial institutions at the cutting edge of digital banking transformation, providing you with the tips and tricks to elevate your game. Today, most financial institutions do not have the insight or data automation necessary to achieve a full understanding of account holders, and proactively address their financial needs and to personalize their engagements. To remain competitive in a very fluid marketplace, financial institutions must apply the right balance of supervised machine learning and automation to data collection, enrichment, account holder analytics, predictions, and engagement. My guests are Leah Webb and Emily Stewart from Meritrust Credit Union and Ben Udell from Monoma Bank. They share how leveraging actionable intelligence to deepen account holder understanding can transform experiences. Customer transactions provide the keys to building engagement, providing recommendations and insights, and can turn the typical digital channel like online or mobile banking into a measurable profit center, reshaping the business model. Transaction data can also be the foundation of models that can impact the bottom line, like with churn and cross-sell. So, Lee and Emily, let's start with you. Can you share how Meritrust Credit Union determined that your organization needed a data-driven strategy? Yeah, so, you know, I think that a lot goes back to wanting to get away from that, um, those conversations when we're strategic conversations of, I feel like, um, the members are wanting this, or I, it's those gut feelings that were happening um, in our ALM conversations to product design to um, credit committee, right? There's all these conversations that are happening that end up coming back to how, how um, different directors or different people felt like was a gut, gut feeling or gut reactions. And we got tired of everything not being data driven and needed the conversations and the decisions that we were making. We wanted it to be based on how um, what the data was telling us. So that's you know kind of how we found how we found segment and why we needed to um, get into our transaction data. So so it's interesting, Ben. You know, we talked about a little bit before we started the broadcast that that many organizations think they're too small to do this right. I mean, obviously, every financial institution executive knows that data analytics is the foundation for great decision-making and better customer experiences, but talking and doing are far different. So how's Monoma Bank prioritized data analytics, and what did it take to invest in such a thing when, when really organizations much bigger than you are challenged by this? Yeah, I, I, th- I think for us, what was really important is we knew we needed data, and there's so many different routes you can go. I think what we did really well was we really started to prioritize what are we going to do with the data? What are our strategic goals? You know, when you look at data, whether it's segment or otherwise, there's millions of data points to use. And so we really pared that down to key strategic initiatives. And then we also looked at how do we actually get data and how do we use it? Is it something that our team can do? Is it something we can learn? Or is it going to be so challenging that we just don't have the tech savvy to be able to do that? So we partnered those two together and then it became real manageable. Then we could build a plan. Then we could work the plan. Then we could apply the plan. And then we could see is the plan actually working for us to hit those strategic goals that that we ultimately with that we started with. Well, you know, sticking with you, Ben, um, we also say that transaction data is the most abundant and valuable account holder data asset. That said, we often have a hard time accessing it and deploying it. So how has your organization unlocked this asset to be actually a leading financial institution in this space and remaining competitive? Yeah, I, I think for us, it's not biting off more than you could chew if we want to if we want to use that term right and so when we start using a lot of the data through segment we're able a good example is we can take a look at home equity data we can see which of our clients have a home equity at other institutions which of them do not what are other key lifestyle indicators that could actually be meaningful so in the past we might go out and do a home equity campaign and it's whether it's direct mail or email and to make it simplified we might do it over a thousand clients and we're guessing at how many of those clients are real targets for us. 
when we start pulling this data out, we might only end up marketing to 500 of them, but we might cut that budget down to be able to market to them, or we might double down on that budget as well. And, and so for us, when we started to unlock this data, we could not only be specific with the campaigns, with the art, with the copy, we could make strategic discussions around when we use our resources, are we, are we applying our full budget to this campaign or are we, gonna, are we gonna pair it back and redirect? And then when we start actually seeing the data come through from real results, that tells us, do we actually accelerate some of the usage? Maybe we go over budget because now we're actually seeing results that are more powerful to our ROI or do we stop? Do we stop faster than what we could do if we were say doing a direct mail campaign to this thousand clients and we don't even we don't even know who they are. So it, it it really strategically changed how we were approaching uncovering opportunities and then applying how we approach those opportunities. So so Leah, could you share how Merit Trust is using transaction data to power better member experiences? Yeah, definitely. One of the goals with using segment specifically was just to know our members better and understand where they shop, how they get paid, how they spend their money, and even the relationships that we don't hold through the competitive insights information. And uh, that was our main priority is understanding our members first and then being who they need to be and meeting, meeting them where they are. So offering products that are relevant to them, like Ben was talking about, and keeping it relevant and interesting for them. So Emily, from your perspective, can you talk a little bit about the process that Meritrust went through to deploy data on and on-time analytics for personalized targeted content? I mean, you know, we, we talk about it, and we, again, we talked about it before the broadcast started, was that, you know, it's one thing to collect the information. It's another thing to deploy it so that the member or customer knows you know them. I mean, I, I talk about the fact that you need to know the customer. The customer needs to know you know them, needs to know they're going to be rewarded, and actually know that you're going to work on their behalf. So how did this whole process begun at Meritrust? Yeah, so I think one thing, since we have this tool now, um, our, as Ben was talking about, the KLIs, these key li lifestyle indicators, a lot of times what we're doing when we're building out concepts of campaigns or things that we're working on with our members is we're pulling that up while we're concepting. So we're always putting the, the, the customer or the member at the forefront of what they want and need instead of trying to say like, oh, we really want to sell a CD product right now. Let's find the people that need CDs. We're sort of flipping that on our head and looking at like what, what type of data, what is the data about our members telling us that we need to offer them. So it, it's really re reversing that, um, the previous way we used to do things, even last year. It's amazing how different um, our team concepts and creates campaigns, it's a complete 180 than we used to. And I think what's really, um, Jim, one thing that we I find really fun is we, we've started to like, the smaller the audience that we create, it's like the more excited we are about it. It's like we found 183 people that, you know, have these unique characteristics that don't have direct deposit, that didn't, that aren't actively using our debit card and, um, you know, are, are using a competitor down the street. Let's, and then we think of this really fun, unique campaign that's personalized, that's unique to that person. And then we make an offer that's very relevant to them. And so that, that's how we're ultimately, you know, executing on these campaigns and delivering that personal, not only having information about members, but delivering a, um, a personalized offer is by letting the data kind of drive us where we go, where we go with these campaigns. A, a customer knows when you're faking it, you know, and, yeah. and it, and it's becoming more and more evident. I mean, I, I, I usually use the reference of uh, Hulu that I know Hulu knows me almost too well because they'll take data that they, know about me from my viewing habits and they'll immediately personalize the next phase of my interaction. The next time I turn on the TV, it'll say, hey, you may be interested in this. If you're just doing things in a mass, then you've missed that. You know, Ben, as we discussed, having the on, on time analytics and personalization content is one thing. Deploying it for the customer's benefit is the other. You know, we, we talk about the, the, the good news stories, but what challenges did you face as you tried to introduce and implement 
this fun uh, functionality at Monona Bank? Yeah, I, I think part of it is you just have this process of getting started with it. So a good example is if we're going to promote, let's call it our Junior Savers program, we can identify who our, uh, the, the parents are with kids, we can create the program, but now we have to sit back and say, all right, what kind of click-through rates are we going to get off of some sort of digital ad? What are we going to get through click-through rates on um, an email campaign? And then we're going to also say, all right, if we can push these clients towards online account opening, how long is that sales cycle from when they get the communication to actually they carry it through? So now we're kind of racking our brains. And on the one hand, we use Segment as a partner to, 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 to benchmark us against others. But, you know, you have all this data and you can literally see it happening. And you're, and you're really thinking to yourself, like, where are my new accounts? You know, where are my new customers? And, and, and so you really have to take that step back to say, you know, what's the right sales cycle? Um, how soon is too soon to change an ad? And so, for instance, with a lot of the digital advertising you can do off of this, you can literally do some A-B testing, or you can certainly see what those click-through rates are, that engagement rate is, and then you, you start to wonder, is that enough? Is it not enough? Is it too much? And do I change it too soon? Do I change the art? Do I change the copy? And, and so there's still, I think, a lot of... Um, a critical thought process that goes into it. That is not going to solve any of this for us necessarily, but it's going to give us, I think, these tools to make some better decisions. And and I, we knew that going into it. It was it's it's just that process of, you know, okay, I got the data. Is it good data or is it bad data? And what am I going to do with the data? It just it goes from do I need data to now I have the data and what am I going to do with it? It's just that problem starts repeating itself. And but candidly, that's the fun part of of dealing with all of this as well to be able to see much more um, immediacy of results and of impact. I mean, that is that is super cool, for lack of a better word, right? You know, it's interesting because we look at, you know, the cost versus a revenue center. And one of the things that data can do, and, and Ben confirmed this for me, that you can use data actually to make a channel like online or mobile banking into a profit center as opposed to simply being a delivery tool. How do you do this? Yeah, I... I would twist that a little bit because I think if we think about how clients are learning about us, they're probably seeing some sort of digital advertisement. They're going to our website. They're doing the research online. So I think really what we're looking at is how do we make the digital space part of a more holistic approach to working with clients rather than a standalone branch, a standalone virtual branch, if you will. And so as we start to approach this, we really start thinking about making sure everything is very complementary, right? And, and an example that might be that home equity example where they're going to get a digital ad, they're going to get an email, they're going to get a direct mail piece, they're going to have a flyer in the lobby. And we just provide this banking experience where clients can bank with us how they want to bank with us rather than pushing them in, in one direction or the other. And that, that takes a lot, especially in my space, I think, in the community bank space. You know, we're used to being relationship oriented and focused, and that doesn't go away, but it's really telling us that when they come into the branch or they call us, you know, that relationship is two times more valuable because there's a reason they're calling us for that. And when they reach out them by, by virtual and digital, it, it just changes that dynamic. And, and we've got to really help our teams understand why people are reaching out to us and what that value means and, and, and taking advantage of that, that interaction. Well, it's interesting. Emily, from your perspective, you know, having the data and analytics at your, at your fingertips, so to speak, allows you to make predictive models and automate predictions on what a customer may want next, and it, it can impact churn and cross-sell. Can you talk a little bit about what Meritrust Credit Union's experience has been here with regard to deploying these models to actually impact those things such as churn and cross but not in a, in a sales mentality, but in a, a customer experience mentality? Yeah, so attrition is something that our organization has really been focused on in the last couple of years. And um, I, we first tried to do something that was like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna figure out some attrition model in house, and that quickly got scrapped because it's so hard to try to deploy something, especially with if you don't have the cleanse data, right? Like the unique thing about what we're talking about today at Segment is that it's cleaning the data. So then when we want to apply um, a predictive model like a cross sell model or an attrition model, then you've got that clean data to leverage, um, to, you know, for for your model's sake. Um, but what what we've done now with that attrition model, now that we have this in our hands, 
is, you know, it's not just looking rough retrospectively of like who's left us because that's what we used to do. Who's left us and you kind of guess why and then you try to understand why and then you'd make some, again, gut reactions that I was talking about before. Like, oh, I think it's because everyone's trading in their car this summer. Like that used to be like a, you know, a thing. Um, now with like our, with our attrition model, we're really able to try to stop that bleed. And that, you know, as everyone knows, it costs a lot more money to acquire a new member than it is to retain one. So that's why we're really focusing on it. We're really focusing on how do we, okay, we're starting to see these signals that people are about to leave us. It could be that they are actively using their debit card. It could be, you know, um, they're not making direct deposits anymore, a plethora of different reasons. Um, we then triage those and we triage those with different personalized campaigns and offers. And we, we, um, our uh, segment rep had kind of helped us curate this idea of this white glove campaign. So we start doing these things where, okay, well, we're going to do a lot more touch points. And, you know, Ben made the point earlier about deploying risk, like how you have, um, if with a smaller audience, you can spend, a, you can either decide to spend your budget, you know, spend more on your budget or you save, save money. And I think that that's what we've really been able to do with these smaller audiences of like, oh my gosh, there's 127 people that are likely to leave us that have, $500,000 on deposit, you know, what, let's really focus in on those people and let's send them a postcard. Let's um, give them a call. Let's figure out what, you know, unique ways to, to interact with them that before they would have gotten the same blanket um, email that the rest of the credit union got about, you know, some generic message. And this totally, you know, having that attrition model and that predictive model gave us the tools to know who who our high target um, members are. It's interesting, Emily, too, that, you know, attrition doesn't look the way it did before. Uh, uh, attrition used to be a person would leave you. The reality is attrition today is not about somebody leaving. It's about somebody not caring as much about you. You know, it's yeah. the it's the Jim Maru saying, "Well, I'm not going to leave my primary bank, but I'm open, I'm going to open my next three accounts or relationships with somebody else." And so, unless you have that data and analytics at your fingertips again, you're in a situation that you won't even notice that their their emphasis or their love of you has changed. You know, this provides you a great tool. You know, you know, Leah, moving to you a little bit. You know, has your focus moved? from simply creating great member experiences to trying to create more engagement, you know, more activity, more interaction with them? And also, how quickly are you able to do data pulls? And does this enhance your decisions around technology investments? Yes, definitely. One of the things that we've been working on is deepening our relationships with existing members. We've talked a lot about attrition and obviously retention is a big part of that. And everybody wants to be their member's primary financial institution. So I think it's a great opportunity to implement what we know about our member when we're offering them relevant offers and products. And as far as making technology investments, I think that it's definitely directed us um, towards understanding what we should focus on in our CRM and how to integrate customer conversations and just in general member experiences. But it's a really great, um, platform to have access to, especially as an analyst who comes from the member service background, because I can definitely overcomplicate things. There's a lot of nuance and in member information, account information, transactional information. And I think that segment does a great job of pulling me out of the weeds and making sure that I don't overcomplicate things. And a good example I have of this is one of our senior leaders was recently at a conference and she wanted to learn more about the members who have buy now, pay later services. So before segment, we would have submitted a data ticket and they would look for transactions from a list of vendors that we provided and then we would get who those people are but we would have to do all that additional research and analysis ourselves with our member information but since we have access to segment we were actually able to pull how many people their demographics what products they have and other information within about 20 or 30 minutes and deliver that to our senior leader so that was definitely a big win for us the really great part about that 
is that that senior leader was still in that mindset of the conference, right, where she was learning about all this disrupting um, technology and oh, how is this going to impact it, and it's swirling around in her mind. And she didn't have to wait weeks for a bit of information. She had before she left the the conference or even the that one breakout session, she was armed with actual data about our financial institution and our membership and how they're using that buy now like pay here platform in like a very reliable from a very reliable source. So that's what we I like. It was mind blowing to me that we could provide that level of detail that fast. Yeah, and Ben, you know, it's interesting because we talk about data analytics and almost always we get into the customer experience and member experience and, and talk about how we do it from a marketing perspective. But again, that data analytics, if you use it correctly, really does, as Emily and Leah mentioned, that it really helps some of your technology decisions and, and product decisions, things of this nature. Can you explain some, maybe how you've done it at your organization a little bit? Yeah, I, I think for us what it really gets down to is you, you think about all that time that you spend building a campaign, doing the research, writing the copy, and Emily and Lee had a good example where we just condense all that down. So our people that are good with marketing, our people that are good with clients, our people that are good on other tasks, they can spend time on those other tasks and we just get this automatic productivity bump and it really doesn't cost us more money to do that. It's easier, and I think it's more engaging for people, right? And that's that's what this is all about, right? It's being more engaging, more relevant. We talk about more relevant for our clients. This is more relevant for our associates as well when they're trying to be successful in how they're trying to perform and how they're trying to help the bank grow and help clients meet their goals. So, so Ben, you, know, you, you mentioned your associates and, and how important that is. What is your thought around, I mean, Technology or data and analytics has often been a silo within an organization. You, you go to a specific area and say, can I get a download of this? Can I get a download of this? But when it's readily accessible ac across the organization to a degree, what is your thought around democratization of data where you actually provide access to employees throughout your organization? Yeah, I, I think... I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges that a lot of banks and credit unions too are going to face over the next five to ten years. It's because you have a lot of legacy associates who are not used to data, aren't used to analytics, aren't used to diving in, aren't used to thinking critically about those topics. So on the one hand, yes, I, I think what we have to do is we have to give our associates, a lot of associates, access to play around, to be curious. But I also think what we do to help bridge that gap is we're pulling out the bites of data that we want to provide to individuals. We want to, we, we, we're not watering this down, right? We have professionals, we have smart people, but we're trying to say if we've got a million data points, here's what I can tell you on home equity opportunity. Then we can go out to the subject matter experts to say, if I have this data and I think this is what it's telling me, what is it telling you? How do we apply that? What other information can we get? And, and so we don't have to train all of our people in analytics. What we have to do is get them thinking critically about what will make good decisions for our organization. And if we can do that, those are, I think, the banks and credit unions that are going to win over the next five years in this data revolution that's still going on. You know, that's interesting. Emily, from your perspective, what is your organization's perspective on what I'm going to call the democratization of data or the giving the tools to employees, be it a, a branch teller, be it a, a product manager, to actually use the insights that have usually been the domain of either the IT people or analytic people or the marketing department. Yeah, so I, I similar. I, my answer is similar to kind of what Ben just gave is like, it's not necessarily, like it's got to be bite size for the frontline staff so that they can, we're, we're making it um, simple by, you know, we're going to import it into the CRM and we're going to give them tools and audiences that need action taken on them. And then they're the sales team, the relationship builders, the people that can help, um, you know, through that middle funnel activity. So I think everything through a sales funnel. And so they're the ones really building those relationships, creating those really important touch points. Um, and then we kind of help bridge that, you know, that gap of like, well, this is the, instead of saying, here's 5,000 people that we need to go after that are likely to leave us, we're saying here's 50 people that are likely to leave us and that are um, important for us to try to capture and win and cross sell or whatever the, the you know, the tactic is. And so for us, it's not, um, it, 
I definitely believe in a data-driven organization, but we have to kind of understand across the board what everybody's roles are. And it's, are you, are you building relationships? Are you building audiences? Are you, know, are you building campaign strategies? And so we all have different roles to play and we should absolutely be a data-driven organization and we'll have to continue to be in the next five years. Otherwise, people, your, or people's organizations will not survive if you're not. But I, I do think it's a matter about how you deploy um, your resources within your organization with, with those data. It's a cultural thing because it really gets down yeah. to if overall the organization realizes the power of data, then it becomes easier to deploy. But as you said, we're all trying to hit that lowest hanging fruit issue. So if you're going to give the tool to somebody, you want to make sure they succeed because otherwise you're going to kill the hand that feeds you, so to speak. You know, if, yeah. you, if you give yeah. it to somebody who can really make use of it and they do so, then they spread the word. You know, Leah, as you look at your organization, and if I was to ask you, what has been the the biggest victory? What is the thing that, that the access to access to data and analytics and insights has been and you were said you know what is the one thing that you guys look and say man oh man this has really been the big success what was it what has it been I think that the biggest success so far has just been showing that marketing has effects in general. Like a lot of the people that come from a marketing background are so astounded that we're able to tie things like emails to accounts opening. That is brand new for them. And not only that, but there's actually the monetary amount attached to it when it's a loan or something like that. So that has been really exciting. And also setting goals outside of just opening dollars. So one of the things that we did last summer was what we called apply with confidence. So we had created a KLI equation with people that we knew may not be the most confident with their money and their credit and we sent them an email with some messaging that said you know apply with confidence we like to say yes we want to help you and we were able to see the results come in and our pri like our main goal was to attract a wider range of credit scores to actually open loans with us because we were leaning you know one way or the other so we were able to see a really good variety of those borrowers come in and it was because of segment that we were able to see the return. Ben, from your perspective, what is the one victory you go? We, we can go around the block a couple of times with this on how, how cool this deployment of data and insights has been in your company. Yeah, I, I think I think for us it's been, it's created momentum to do more in the digital space that makes it relevant for clients, right? Because we can see the data and we can start applying this process to our other marketing products or our marketing tech stack. And you see the results, you see that it's affecting clients positively. And that's just exciting for individuals. It starts, it starts blossoming in much, much larger ways. And if it's exciting for our associates because it's getting results with our clients, that's only going to be good for everybody involved in this entire process, clients included. So Ben, we're going to wrap this up now with all three of you. And, and, you know, I'm going to start with you, Ben. What recommendations do you give to banks and credit unions around your size as they attempt to build a data-led culture? You know, what, what will define the winners and losers and, and where do you start? I, I, I think it's two simple things that are interconnected. The first is what are your strategic goals as an organization? For us, it's the bread and butter of uh, increasing deposit relationships and it's really on the consumer side, it's home equity and credit cards. So what are your strategic goals? And then finding a program, a platform, the data that allows you to, to frankly simply go after that and chase that down and you can apply it. It fits in your technology, it fits in your tech stack. You got people that can fulfill upon that. Don't do anything more than that at this point in time, right? Get that momentum to start where you can see results. And I think those are the two things that lead to that. Leah, what recommendations do you have to organizations your size that right now may be stuck on stop. I mean, the, re the reality is we all know we have to go there, but it always takes more than, than we think. And, and, and sometimes it takes a small step first, but what do you recommend, Leah? 
One of the things that I recommend is building a culture where your employees and your staff is comfortable challenging you and your ideas so that you're able to move forward. Of course, I say that because I'm not the boss, so it's a little bit easier for me to say, yes, just confront your boss. But I really do think that creating that culture of being challenged and being questioned about why you think something is going to really help especially credit unions move forward as we have so many legacy policies and just in general ideals. Leah, I'll tell you right now that you're you're all on this this podcast today because you have a culture that already exists that your leadership allows you to do this. Um, we talked before the podcast of organizations that may not have that culture, may have a legacy <laughs> thought process, may not embrace change and all that. And if you don't have that then most of what we said here is outside your control. Um, On the other hand, it's exciting. I mean, you can just tell by your enthusiasm we talk about this that only it's only possible because your leadership did say, we're going to commit to this. We're going to double down on this. Mm -hmm. Emily, what's what's your recommendation? My recommendation is to start somewhere, right? And I, I think the best place that we started was starting to realize we need cleanse data. Like, that's the hard part. Why We knew that when we were asking questions about um, well, which of our members are using Capital One or which of our members, you know, those like those big questions that we asked in strategic meetings. We knew that every time we needed to ask that, our brilliant data team, it was difficult for them because they were spending most of their time trying to make sense of all the muck of our dirty transaction data. And so I say when you're starting this journey, I say start with finding a way to get that stuff cleaned up. And then that makes the rest of the journey so much easier. So I think that was the light bulb moment for me. It was like, oh, that's our problem. It's it's not that we don't, we have a great data team and we have great data analysts. We're just dealing with a lot of muck in our data warehouse and we need to make sense of it. And so that's why you got to start somewhere and then you got to find a right partner to help you do that with. And don't feel like just because you're a medium sized organization that um, you should try, you're big enough to try to do it yourselves. Cause I think that was kind of at first what we thought we were going to have to do. And um, we realized there were vendors that help us, that could help us do that. And I, I suggest, you know, start with, you know, you're finding scalability that way with finding the right vendor. What a great way to end that because really it is getting down to, you have to find a partner that's going to ask the right questions and deploy the right solutions. If you're waiting and saying, we'll do that once we clean up our data, you're starting at the wrong point because your partner can help you do that. It's amazing what these third-party providers can do today to get you from garbage in to beauty out. And, And as you said, it doesn't matter how big your organization is. Thinking you can build it yourself at speed and scale is virtually impossible. Before we got on the podcast today, we had a discussion around speed and scale and, and how ideas could take a year, two years to implement. The reality is if you find the right partner, they will help you implement things that you may have put on an annual plan into a quarterly disposition. It allows you to take those little successes and build from those. Instead of trying to say, oh, geez, how can we afford it? How can we do it? I really suggest that small organizations say, find a partner or a couple partners that you feel confident in and then have them figure these out for you. They're not neophytes to this. This is not, well, maybe your first time. It's not their first rodeo, and they can help you get there. Ben, Leah, Emily, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and the Visionary Podcast presented by Alchemy. You, you provided both interesting stories and great hope for those organizations that may not be experiencing the successes that you have. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Fissionary Podcast. We hope you enjoyed our deep dive into all the tips and tricks you can use to elevate your digital game. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to support the podcast and share it with your coworkers or people outside your organization. Also, post it on social media or give it a thumbs up. Thanks again, and we'll chat with you next time on the Fissionary Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Roos. Until next time, remember... To become future-ready, financial institutions of all sizes must use instantly accessible customer insights to meet expanding expectations.